Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first in our series, Students Talk to You About Teaching. Um, this is a great series put on by our CoLab student affiliates, and That's Robin, not us, right? Yeah, Robin Froese. <laughs> um, we've got more series coming up. Um, whoever's giggling, I can hear you. Um, and actually now it just said my internet is unstable. So please tell me if I stop working. Um, but we are going to have a session tomorrow where students are going to talk about um, group work and project-based work. Um, and then later on, I believe in April, we have a session where students will talk to you about empathetic teaching. So um, all sorts of cool things in this wonderful new series. Um, but again, today we are talking about open educational resources and I am joined by two wonderful CoLab student affiliates, Tony and Natalie. Um, so we are going to start with Natalie, and I'm going to ask her to introduce herself and, uh, and kick it off for us. There you go, Nat. Hi, I'm Natalie. I am a student affiliate with the CoLab. Um, I'm a junior, so I'm in my third year, year here as an accounting student. Um, very exciting. <laughs> but today I want to talk to you a little bit about open educational resources and specifically first the student costs. Um, I spoke to a pretty small group um, of students here at PSU uh, to collect some information about costs that they incurred this spring semester. The lowest total we had was $60. Um, and it's worth noting that when she brought this number to my attention, she made it very clear that this was something abnormal, that this was the lowest she'd ever seen them. And usually they're two to three times that amount. Um, and the highest we had was 300. And that student whose books told up to 300 were listed at $586 on our school bookstore. It was through Amazon, and eBay, and those types of channels that they were able to cut their bill drastically. Um, here's a really cool data set. Um, it shows kind of the textbook spending per student. It goes down through the years, which we can see trends with Amazon and using eBay and things like that um, to find those at a lower price, which if you compare it to a chart with the textbook prices, like from your normal bookstore, this is a very, very lower number. Um, so it's actually, that's a great point, Nat. I hadn't even thought about that, but like, I think the, the spending of students is going down, and but actually if you look at other graphs, yeah, the top costs of textbooks are going up. So there's a lot of complexity to why mm -hmm. the spending is going down. Um, I think you're totally right that it's students being creative about what they're gonna buy and not buy and how they're gonna buy it. But mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about putting those two things next to each other. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about my personal experience with open educational resources. Um, as an accounting student, it is extremely rare to have courses that use OER because, you know, we're in the world of math where everything, the publishers are reprinting books every year and hiking the prices. Um, I think I've been in a total of three classes that made the switch from costly textbooks to OER, and only one of those was an accounting based class. The other were my gen eds. Um, but working at the CoLab has really allowed me to discover and learn about OER, which I have found to be really, really interesting because if there's ways to cut these costs for students, I don't understand why it's not happening. Um, especially we're already paying so much to be in school here. These added costs can kind of make or break um, students' budgets. Um, but in the CoLab, I do a lot of research for professors who do want to switch the materials which has given me a lot of exposure to the different types of open educational resources, um, as well as getting really good at hunting them down. Um, and Natalie's gonna come back and talk about some other pieces of stuff she's working on later, but um, we are gonna turn it over to Tony now. Hi, so I'm Tony. I'm a junior here. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary studies major uh, and my like focus 
it's not a couple of different realms, but mainly it's uh, the combination of psychology and adventure education. Um, so this was done for my like intro to interdisciplinary class. And I thought it was just a perfect way to reuse um, one of my previously done kind of assignments. And so open education is really important, I think, for a lot of uh, like students and faculty on top of it. I know for me, coming from psych and environmental science classes, it definitely has changed in the past couple of years. Um, I remember at the school that I first went to, open education resource, that was not really a thing that I had to buy my textbooks and you know they were expensive because they're those intro classes. And so when I came here and I was taking a bit more um, like kind of niche subjects, it became a lot easier for, I think, the professors to find us um, a lot more just information that was free to us. And they saw the like importance that it had for us to learn. It just makes learning, I think, a lot easier because it's not as um, like very textbook oriented. It's it's more information that's kind of given through a bunch of different ways. Um, and it's a collaborative uh, type of kind of research and textbook. So like on this first um, just slide that you see, there's obviously certain um, kind of comments that they try and go for in open education, such as retaining that information, reusing that information, um, being able to modify it, remix it, meaning like change it, and then redistribute it towards people. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can find open education resources. I think it's just a bit difficult for people to truly know if that's going to like make a difference um, for them. So if you can move to the next slide, Ron, thank you. So this was one aspect that I think is interesting. So on my psych, like my psych kind of track, I'm going into more research based stuff. So I'd hope to be like published within a certain degree um, and have a lot of just different ways to find information. Um, you know, we have the like open website library where you can find a bunch of like published items. Um, but if you don't go to a school or a university, sometimes like those aren't accessible to you. Um, so I think just having the ability to find really easily done and like make sense and it's not super wordy and it's, it's done in a good way is also really informative for research kind of topics. Um, and I think like, for example, I had a class um, last year where it was environmental ed and we had to uh, do a syllabus. And it wasn't like we had to like make a whole new form of a syllabus or a lesson plan. So it was really just like in helpful that I knew open education because it was my first time ever making a lesson plan. And I was able to just look up lesson plan on plastic pollution and found so many that were like free rights, free use, free remix, like in that I was able to then like kind of put my own little spin on it. And I think other kids that didn't know about that had a much harder time feeling like they had to create a whole new lesson plan that was very like, I, specific. I just have to say, I didn't really understand like how you two would dovetail, but it's so great because Natalie really set up the, the cost savings piece and the sort of um, accessibility and affordability of college that we'll talk about in a second. But Tony, you're really talking about the the fact that these open licenses allow people to share more or, or permit sharing means that people who need stuff to learn have better access to stuff they need. And also that those resources tend to sometimes be better, interestingly, because so, sometimes people are like, oh, they're free, they must suck, right? And we have a lot of data that shows exactly the opposite. But really what you're talking about is you know, because people can tailor things to be just what they need, um, the stuff ends up being better than a one size fits all textbook, which maybe as for most students is not a very engaging thing to learn from. Um, so I think really you, you've, you've lined that stuff up well. Also, there's so much good stuff on their slides. I wanna let you know that I'll um, put the slide deck in the chat um, in, a, in a little bit as soon as we 
we get through a little bit more. So let me do a couple of other little slides and then we'll um, turn it back to these two folks um, about actually, is this yours too, Tony? That was just a, like the picture Ooh. that's in it is yeah. one that I kind of took from Creative Commons um, website. And it yeah, just kind of blows that. it up bigger just because, and I like the visual that it had, so. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. And BC Campus is one of our great friends in the collab. They put out so many great materials. Um, they, they're they a lot bigger shop than the collab, but, but that's kind of maybe what our shop would look like if we had like 40 people working in it. So super great. Um, look at these too. I didn't even know these were in here. They were not in here before. Tony, you're, you're blowing up my mind with all these cool things. Awesome. Um, and we're not going to dwell too much on this stuff. Um, and I see Kristen here too, Kristen Wixon, our librarian, who contributed some of this stuff as we go through. Um, but there's there's some places I want to direct you towards, I think that will be helpful. Um, the, the main part of Sarah Goldrick Rabb's research that I want to point out um, is that middle one there, that 50 to 80% of the sticker price of college is not from tuition. So what that means is that things like paying for your transportation, paying for your room and board, paying for your books, these things proportionately actually make up a huge part of the cost of college. So if you reduce the prices of those things, you can make a big impact on college affordability, which sometimes we sit around and say like, you know, in New Hampshire, I don't get any say in how much we charge for tuition, right? It's really coming from even outside the university. So to know that we can make a difference on certain kinds of things like textbook costs does impact that overall cost enormously. Here's the other chart that should have gone right next to Natalie's because um, it shows that students are paying less from textbooks, but the cost of college textbooks is still rising much faster than the rate of inflation. Um, sometimes you'll hear people, um, some, sometimes those college um, costs are going down because of the publishers themselves, because they're offering package deals, like inclusive access. So Natalie and Tony, Lee, I'd be curious, like in some of your classes, do you have to purchase access codes that allow you to do homework sets and stuff like that? Uh, yes, 90% of my classes do use an online platform. Oh yeah, the map. Okay, so 90%, remember that's in accounting, so that makes sense, right? Yeah, um, I've but, only had two this is a, And you have one, and psychology often has them uh, as well, um, less so adventure ed with the online platforms. Um, and there's nothing wrong with online platforms. Like you guys know, I'm, I'm cool with online. The problem is that the way those often called inclusive access deals work is that like Natalie used to be able to rent a book or borrow a book or get a book on reserve in the library. There's no way to do that with an access code that's tied to her username. She has to buy it. She can't return it. Um, it can't, you can't resell it. And so even though they charge a little bit less for it, they're doing that to undercut all the ways that students used to save money. Um, and of course, OER has online platforms. It has data sets, it has, ho has homework banks, it has assessments. Um, they're just not always um, as slick and well-funded. And sometimes we're a little bit behind um, where the publishers are with their multi-million dollar investments. So we're trying to catch up in those areas. Um, most of you have probably seen stats like this before. Um, like I won't even deign to ask Natalie and Tony if they've ever not bought a required book or if they know someone who hasn't bought a required book. I mean, it's 66% of students are sometimes not buying required books because of cost alone. Um, and then you can see that the effects of that on student success is enormous. So if you have like retention initiatives or anything like that at your college, you definitely wanna be looking at OER um, because we have so much data that shows that textbook costs are causing students to drop, fail and withdraw from courses and also take fewer credits um, on their way to graduation, which which delays graduation or makes it less likely. So um, just to recap, OER, remember, and this is something that I, I had the best conversation with Natalie the other day. OER, my friends, is not free stuff on the internet, right? Um, lots of stuff is free on the internet. I encourage you to use it all for your classes as much as you want. 
Um, but Natalie was recently processing some uh, surveys from faculty where they talked about the OER that they were using. But most of the stuff was not open educational resources. It, it was free stuff on the internet. The difference is that OER has an open license. So it makes it not just free, um, like no cost, but also free like freedom, meaning that you can do all sorts of cool things with it. Um, this I know for a fact is Kristen's slide. So thank you, Kristen. Um, and this goes right to what Tony was talking about before about all the things you can do with something that's openly licensed. So free stuff on the internet, you generally cannot revise that and then put your own name on it, right? That would be called plagiarism and you would be violating copyright. Um, but with OER, you are allowed to make changes. You're allowed to uh, put that in a printed book or put it on your website or whatever, as long as you're giving credit to the originals. Um, and all of that happens with what we call the Creative Commons license. Um, Creative Commons is an organization, but it is also um, a specific license that sits on top of copyright and makes these materials quote unquote open. So when we're talking about OER, we're actually specifically talking about stuff that has this open license. And that's what, um, what Natalie and Tony and Kristen and I and others can help you locate if you want to um, reduce the cost of your, of your classes. Um, particularly, there are specific folks who can help you um, work on these stuff, on these things. Uh, like I said, Kristen and other librarians are kind of the best at searching. Um, and Kristen has built what we call a libguide at that link there. Again, I'll give you this in the, in the chat in a minute. Um, that libguide is a great first click to help you get to all the places to search for OER. Um, but I'll tell you that just like when you're first learning to use Google, um, it can kind of be overwhelming to figure out how to find the good stuff. But a really quick conversation with somebody like Kristen or Natalie who are trained on these things can be um, can save you a lot of time. So librarians are the key. Um, academic technologists are great once you find something and you're like, how do I get this to my students? Like, here it is over here on this website. Do I have to download it? Do I have to upload it? Do I have to link it? Like, what do I do? You don't have to know anything about technology to use OER and um, putting in a IT ticket can get you some help from a technologist. Um, folks like uh, me and Martha in the CoLab um, can help you with issues like, uh, okay, I found this great thing, um, but I really want to tie it to a cool assignment. Um, or I'd like it to be part of my, my original textbook, like how can I weave it in to my class effectively so we can help you with assessments and assignments and linking it up to stuff you're already using. Administrators can help too, because it's really great to have funding um, to do the work of replacing your textbooks with OER. And um, in the past, we've had really great support from USNH in particular. So we wanna keep encouraging our administrators not just to ask us to lower the costs of our classes, but also to support us in doing, doing that extra work. Um, there's also a really great network on Twitter, um, I, I maybe call it academic Twitter, where you can uh, tag things with the tag OER and get lots of people helping you find different things. And, and of course, Google is still a pretty good uh, resource for, um, for looking for things. Lots of folks at Plymouth are also writing OER. That doesn't mean they're writing an intro to accounting textbook. And there'd be no reason to do such things because those textbooks already exist. They were million dollar funded initiatives from people like Hewlett and Davis and they're great. So you don't need to write an intro textbook necessarily. Um, but people are doing all sorts of things, uh, cool things with their students and with each other. Um, to make stuff and openly license it or to revise or remix stuff that's already out there. These are some of the things that people at Plymouth State have been involved in openly licensing and sharing. Um, I know in IDS, we've made a bunch of textbooks with our students that are in use. Um, so there's, there's lots of really cool assignments that you can do with your students um, once you start engaging with OER. Or you can just be as simple as our biology department here at Plymouth State, which for the most part uses only openly licensed textbooks. Um, the commercial textbooks in biology tend to be about 300 bucks a pop. Uh, the 
OpenStax books that they use are either free or about 50 bucks if they choose to get them printed. Um, so whether you adopt, adapt, or create, there's lots of room uh, to do cool stuff. Openpedagogy.org is a good site that has more of the fun stuff that you can do with um, assignments and projects related to OER beyond just cost savings. Um, so that is the end of um, our official stuff, but I wanted to just turn it over to Nat really quickly to, to talk a little bit about how we track um, the cost savings that we have for students and um, also a little bit about the OER hub. So tell us what you know, Nat, and I can fill in the blanks afterwards. Yeah, of course. So we reach out to our faculty um, and they send in the links to the OER they're using, how much their textbook they replaced was, so we can gather how much they're saving for their students. Um, I worked on a project la over the winter, I believe, um, that we tallied up all of those savings and it was a crazy amount that people here have saved for us students, um, which is so great to see. Um, and along with that, we've started, we have what is called an OER hub. It's on OER Commons, and it's a hub where you can find all of the OER that has been uploaded from all of the schools within New England, not New England, New Hampshire, same thing. Um, but it's really, really cool. You can do it by discipline, or you can see them by, like, by school, which is really awesome, but I've been uploading those there. It's a really great resource if you're just getting started with OER and don't know where to start. Um, I think it's definitely something everyone should take a look at, see if those things can work for you. And also, if you have things to add, add them. Yeah, so I dropped those links in the chat there, particularly that second one, the New Hampshire Open um, OER Hub. We have a group of folks from higher ed all across the state of New Hampshire. The hub is now funded by the Department of Education. Um, and, and basically, uh, Plymouth State was more or less one of the founding members of this initiative. So it's really exciting. The OER hub is a great place, particularly thanks to Natalie, um, to go to see like, you know, if you teach um, intro to psychology, what intro to psych books are in use in New Hampshire. Um, it's just getting started. It's really only a semester um, or so that we've been uploading. So over the next year, I think you'll see a lot more stuff starting to go in there, but um, that's a great resource for finding stuff and also a great resource for chatting with other faculty and staff who are interested in, in OER. Um, if you're not a member of the hub, you just hop right over to that link and, um, and sign yourself up. And I highly encourage you to become a, a member, which kind of sounds like you're gonna get charged dues or something. So it's just, you just create an account and then you can um, not just view the hub, but you can interact and ask questions or whatever you need. So that is what we have. So we are a small group, but does anybody have any questions, particularly for Tony or Natalie? But of course, um, others are here too, including, including Kristen. Um, anything we can answer for you? And actually, maybe what I'll do is I will go ahead and stop recording. Um, that way, folks can feel comfortable to ask questions if you have them and not worry about the recording. So thank you, online viewers. Here I go.